Please bow your heads with me for prayer. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you for this Sabbath morning that we can worship you. We invite your presence in this church and in our hearts that we may receive your word and help fulfill your plan for our lives. Thank you for the opportunity to learn more about your great love for us. We ask that you would be with our service, may it be a blessing to all who are here and those watching. We give you all the glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. My name is Connor Thal and I am an 11th grader at Loma Linda Academy. I want to welcome you all who are here today or tuning in on LLBN or online. On behalf of the Loma Linda University Church, I would like to welcome you. We are honored to be with you today. We have a very special Sabbath school for you. Our lesson study will be given by Dr. Calvin Thompson. He teaches here at the Loma Linda University School of Religion. And our offertory music will be given to us by Connor Church and Joshua Chai. The Mission Spotlight will be presented by Ezrika Bennett, who is a Loma Linda University Church elder. I would also like to thank Brett Strauss for our opening prayer. Our song service leader, Wilson Hanawi, and the choristers, Diana Lozano and Summer Hodgkin. I would also like to thank our musician, Alex Hodgkin on the cajon, Connor Church on the piano, and Josh Chai on the cello. All of us are high school students at Loma Linda Academy, and we would love your continued prayers on our behalf as we grow into adults. We pray that our Sabbath school will be a blessing. Thank you. Good morning, church family. Uh, my name is Ezrika, and I will be doing the Mission Spotlight today. And I'm really excited, as I think I am about most things in life, just to share about um, experiences I gained while I was a student missionary. So I was a student missionary for nine years of my life, from the age of 17 till nine years later. And um, some of the best experiences um, that I've had personally thus far have come from being on the mission field. So I just wanted sh to share a few short stories that really had um, deep impact on me uh, with you guys. The first one comes from 2013. My team and I, we went to Oklahoma um, because there was a tornado that devastated a city. Uh, the city was more Oklahoma. And I'm not sure if you've heard of the Fajita scale, the scale that they, uh, they grade tornadoes on, but essentially an F5, which means, or it was an EF5, which means that uh, there are wind speeds above 200 miles per hour went through a city and the entire city of Moore was pretty much like demolished. It was a 14 mile radius uh, devastation zone. Um, and elementary school also was completely demolished. Uh, students lost their lives. 
and about 24 people in total. So one of the things my organization did is we went and did disaster relief. So once we heard about the tornado, we knew that we had to go and help pull debris and sing songs and just play our band and do whatever we could. Um, so we drove from Alabama to Oklahoma. And for the most part, the ride, everything, it was innocuous. Everything seemed like, you know, nothing tremendous had happened. But when we made it to Moore, it was a completely different story. I cannot make this up. You could stand at any given point and look to the horizon and all you would see were homes and businesses completely demolished and it was really humbling. But one, um, one experience that kind of changed my life as we broke it down or got out of the van and were walking around to see if we could help pull debris or pray with people, there was one particular family and um, they were standing on top of their fallen house and praising God like they were singing and shouting. And my friend, his name is Big Guy because he's six foot eight. My friend and I were like, what are they doing? Like, why are they so excited? So we went to talk to them and um, they were sharing stories about how they got the last minute word of the tornado and um, crammed their whole family in one closet. and we then noticed that everything in their house had fallen except for a particular closet. So they pointed to this closet and they're like, this is where we were. God saved our entire family. We don't even care that we don't have a house anymore. We are all alive. And another thing that stood out to me um, was they were trying to give us their food. Like, are you guys hungry? Do you want food? And I'm like, no, ma'am, we are the volunteers. We came to help you. We don't need your food. But in that moment, it was such a re revolutionary concept. Like they are trying to comfort us because they've been comforted. And that's 2 Corinthians 2, uh, 1 verse 4, where it says he comforts us in our trouble so that we can go and comfort others. And I'll never forget that situation because they had every reason to be distraught, but they knew that God had just spared their lives and their main goal was not only to try to help us, the volunteers that came to help them, but also to go and spread love to their neighbors. And so that, that's one experience that um, really changed my life. Another experience that I think revolutionized my understanding of just like missionary work. Oh, and also, in the nine years that I was a student missionary, because I'm, an, because I'm international, I actually never did overseas mission work. Like I only ever worked here in the United States. And that kind of showed me that mission work isn't limited to just being a, an, like in the bush of Africa or in South America or in Asia. Like you can do mission work right here in your backyard or your front yard. You can do it. So another verse that I really like, Hebrews 6.10, where it pretty much says that God is not unjust to forget like your labors of love as you have served his people. Super paraphrase that, but it, that's the concept. Um, for me, as I mentioned, I was an international student. Uh, so a part of why I was a missionary for nine years is because it took me eight years to graduate from college. Not because like I struggled academically, but I, being international, didn't have financial aid. So every semester, it was like a prayer and a struggle just to find the funds. But I remember uh, one spring break going on a mission trip, a trip to Virginia, and we ended up like in this small Adventist church in the middle of nowhere, and um, it, was, it was a really nice service, and they were asking for prayer requests, and that year, that was the year I was supposed to graduate, maybe for like the third time. So I'm like, come on, God, you can do this. I know, I know we can make it this time. But I just remember feeling impressed to say, to go up to the front as the church asked for prayer requests, um, and just say, I need you to pray that I can find the money to graduate. Not not even asking the church for that, but just putting the prayer request there because the church just kind of felt like home. And so as I shared my prayer request, it was like something or like the Holy Spirit moved and they decided to take up my cause. And they're like, listen, for all the work you do, we're going to help you. And I'm like, okay, sure. I'll believe it when I see it. Um, not, not, well, that sounds really terrible. <laughs> like, but I was like, okay, long story short, they, they took it to the board. They ended up um, just doing a lot and raising a thousand dollars that would go to my end uh, balance. And I'll never forget because at the end of that year when it was time for me to graduate, when God had done all his mighty miracles and got me the funds so that I could, um, could 
could walk or graduate, the balance that was missing was exactly $1,000. And I just remember thinking, man, what if I never went on this mission trip? What if I didn't follow God's leading to go to this particular place? God used that. And he also just reminded me, as I'm serving his people, it's not that he's just leaving my life to fall apart, but really he's working on our behalf. And back to that verse in Hebrews 6.10, like it's not even an incentive to go. Like if I go and serve God, then he's going to bless me. God blesses us irrespective of what we do, but it's a reminder that when we do love his people, he takes notice note of that. He is considerate of that. And, um, and he does, in turn, bless us immensely. So I just remember thinking, man, I went on this mission trip to serve, but God showed me that as you are here working for my people, please know that I am fighting endlessly on your behalf. And um, back to just the organization, I, I think I should kind of give you a picture of how it went. So for the nine years that I was a student missionary, just about every Christmas break, Thanksgiving break, spring break, and summer break, I was on a mission trip. So I've been to 44 of the states, and one of the things we would do, we would um, go to juvenile detention centers, minister to the young men that are in, young men and women that were incarcerated. And at that time, they're like my age. So you know, I'm 18, they're 16. So me coming and bringing the gospel to them is really relevant because it's like not only are you my age, but oftentimes I was their I was their skin color. So it's like you could be my sister. You could be someone that grew up in my community, but instead you're studying, you're going to school at that time to be a doctor. Not going to be a doctor anymore. But anyways, studying to be a doctor in college, if you can do it, I can do it too. So that was one of the things we did. We fundraised often for overseas missions. So while I didn't get to go to different um, countries, I did help in the preparation of about 15 overseas missions. And just thousands of baptisms were um, accrued as a result of the organization going out. And that's not a glory to us, that's all the glory to God. Um, and we played our band, we would go door to door and canvas. So I canvassed for nine years of my life. And you know, as I'm older, I'm like, I don't know if I could do this anymore. It was a lot of rejection, um, but still like a lot of character growth. So a lot of my time was spent just pouring into people and learning to love um, as Christ does, and then seeing God just work in my life, because mission work is not, it's very much twofold. As you are striving to be a blessing to others, God is working on your heart and molding you and making him more like you. And so this last story, which is actually my favorite um, experience or one of the most meaningful exper experiences I had while on the mission field, um, comes from New York City, and as I mentioned, we canvassed, so a lot of times we would do it in neighborhoods, so going door to door and knocking, but then there were times we would do it in the big cities, um, and this one comes from New York, and it's funny, I just started a YouTube channel, and this is the first story that I shared because it made such an indelible mark on my mind that I don't know that, f I will never forget this experience for the rest of my life, so come with me, we're on the streets of New York, New York is just busy, hustle and bustle, people are going about their business, and here we are, some teenagers, and uh, playing our little marching band, giving out literature, we have this hope, and peace above the storm, which I think is steps to Christ, and, um, and me, I was playing in the band on that day, so that meant I didn't get to talk to people. I don't know if you can tell, I really like talking to people, so that was pretty disappointing. But when we took a break, I was like, ha-ha, now's my opportunity. I'm going to go give out books as well. And so, um, so I took a book that said, we have this hope, and um, I'm walking down the street all chipper and excited, and I tried to give it to a guy. He completely shuts me down and plays my life. And I'm like, well then. But I still have the book in my hand and there's a lady sitting and I kind of turn awkwardly to her like, do you want this book? And she looks at me and she starts screaming, you're the sign, you're the sign. And I'm just like, well, I'm, oh, okay. But then she proceeds to explain her story how no electricity, no lights at home, just no food, no money. She was across, she had come to the courthouse to beg them for some, some type of mercy. Her daughter was sitting next to her, lupus, her body, just all, all types of scars. And um, she told me that the night before, she told God, if you don't give me a sign of hope, I'm taking my life the next day. 
And that was the day I happened to meet her. It wasn't happened. That was the day God ordained for me to meet her. And I just remember, because at the time I was, I was really young, just remember this really heavy feeling like, did God just use me? But I'm not special. There's nothing spectacular about me. I was just where God wanted me to be um, when he needed me to be there. And as a result, God's love became through me became the sign that this woman's life was worth living. And this story, again, I've shared so many times in front of just thousands of people because it ingrained in my mind that I'm, we, we are meant to be the sign of hope for people, that God desires to use us. It's not just going through life, doing work, raising our families, starting a family or whatever it is, that God wants us to be so intermingled in each other's lives. He wants us to bear each other's pain, to rejoice when, we, when each other rejoices. He wants us to be the sign of hope. And what a beautiful place we live in where um, there's so much excellence and a lot of education and greatness here. And then across the way, there's still excellence and greatness, but it's hidden underneath poverty and, and, and a, uh, a lack of education and how beautiful it is that we can go and take this message of God's love to them, especially as they may be going through consistent stress, hard times, brokenness, and pain. And um, the, the title of this testimony was Remember Your Creator in the Days of Your Youth. And so I actually just wanted to put a charge out there, not just to you, the audience, but maybe a young person is watching this now and they're like, I want to do more. Well, do it. You will never regret going to serve God. Maybe you're on a mission right now. This is such a beautiful opportunity for you to get closer to God because service doesn't save us, but it does create this beautiful environment where we can be so intimate and get to know God. So if you're on a mission trip now, and just take this time and say, Lord, mold me. Make me into everything you want me to be. When you had plans for me, what were they? Show me my future. Show me the things in me, the people around me, the things in me, the habits, the thoughts that don't draw me closer to you. Just take this opportunity to allow God God to mold you. And again, if you are consider considering doing service, it doesn't matter if you are in your teenage years, your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, do it. Serving God and actively walking with God on the mission field is one of the most beautiful things that we can experience in life because we were created to love and to serve and created to be in community. And so those are just some experiences from my time as a missionary. There are other stories, um, stories I heard from overseas, just spectacular miracles that I've seen God do. But um, for today, I just want to encourage us that we are called to serve. And again, that doesn't mean going to some foreign country, but if you're there, that's pretty dope. Do it with all your heart. But if it's here in San Bernardino, in Loma Linda, in your practice, in your home, then love God and serve him with all your heart and you will see the blessings prolifer pr proliferate in your life. And then also you will see that your relationship with God becomes more meaningful um, if you pursue that actively. So that's my mission story for today. And I hope that we are all motivated to uh, take up our cross and serve God's people and then see God come to life in our lives personally. Um, so yes, that's my story for today. And right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray for the offering. So if you would bow your heads and close your eyes with me, I will pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for your day, um, the opportunity to be in your house worshiping. And I pray that we, we will all just consider that there is more for us to do, um, ways that we can serve and love our neighbors and our neighbors. It's not limited to those next to us, but maybe you're calling us to some foreign country. Maybe you're calling us to a, a community not too far from us, but God, you are always calling us because your hand comes to life when we serve. And I know that, again, we are not saved by our works and service is not uh, just the means to being accepted by you, but it is proof that we love you, that we are so in love with you 
you that we want to just give back to our church, give back to our families, our friends, our community. We want people to know about this grace and mercy that we found. So I pray for the watchers and the hearers and those present in this room right now that we will be galvanized to serve you more, to love you more, to dive into deeper relationships. And oh yes, please bless the offering. I pray in your name, amen. One of the things I've been discovering over the last several weeks is one of the occupational hazards of the way I end up getting assigned to various topics. Most of the time I tell people like Pastor Miguel, I just said, whenever you need me, just put me in, plug me in when there's a vacancy, and I don't do it by picking the topics. I just do it by saying I'm available whenever you need me. So over the last several weeks, as I've been speaking both here and in various Sabbath schools and various other places around campus, I've had an interesting pattern emerge. And it reminds me of something I heard a few years ago when I was at a presentation for pastors on picking sermon topics. The presentation said, always pick something really positive and pick something with lots of very practical life applications. So I look, last time I was here in general lesson study, my topic, assigned topic, was the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Pestilence, war, famine, and death. I was thinking also last week, I was speaking for Praxis, the young adult service, and the topic I was assigned was really the most difficult section of the Gospel of John dealing with the crucifixion. It didn't even deal with Christ and his disciples or the resurrection or anything like that. It was just right in the midst of the most gruesome aspects of the crucifixion. 
And I was even noticing in general lesson study again, last week, Pastor McGill was talking about the everlasting gospel. And the topic I got assigned, drum roll, seven last plagues. So anyway, once again, here I am on one of the dark, difficult topics. I'll try to figure out a way to make it all positive and inspirational and hopeful. Seven last plagues. You can't imagine a better topic than that. Actually, since the seven last plagues are in part derived from the plagues of Egypt, I mean, I kind of uh, you know, build on that basic theme, I can actually think of one way in which the plagues could have been wonderful. I went through a stage when I was, I think in fourth grade, where I was obsessed with frogs. And it happened because my parents had taken us to a place called Tapia Park, kind of out in the Calabas uh, Calabasas area. And it was springtime, the tadpoles were just turning into frogs, and there were frogs everywhere. And I had not necessarily been all that interested in frogs before, but I'll tell you, I got really interested in frogs. I went through a stage where I was obsessed with frogs. I would draw frogs on my math papers. I would collect um, pictures of frogs. I was reading all the books about frogs. I learned all about different kinds of frogs' eggs, whether they were little clumps or whether they were in strands, you know, all those different things. And I'll tell you, if you had told me that my house would have had frogs everywhere, that that would have been a plague, I would have thought that was the most wonderful plague I could possibly have imagined. You know, frogs in my bed, frogs under the bed, frogs in the food, frogs jumping up and down the halls. Wow, that would have been heaven on earth. Well, anyway, let's move beyond that and let's take away, you know, let's look at some of the, the basic points I wanna talk about this morning as we think about the seven last plagues. First thing, thing I mentioned to the people I was talking to last week when I did the Praxis, the young adult service. We were talking about the really grim aspects of the crucifixion of Jesus. We were also talking about Pilate, this guy who had personality by popular opinion poll. You know, kind of like, what do I do? What am I supposed to do here? These people all want to crucify Jesus and I don't know what to do. Talking about how that was actually part of Pilate's ongoing personality. We could look at some of the historical records. You know, he kind of tried to make people happy, kind of got caught between the, you know, the Roman government and the people and just kind of waffled back and forth. But the crucifixion itself, even the most grim aspects of the crucifixion of Jesus are a reminder of one basic principle. There is no resurrection without the cross. And that's important because most of us want to skip the hard stuff. And I actually had the um, people get into little groups for part of it and then they were supposed to share a story of a time in their life when they thought they could basically have a resurrection without the cross. In other words, we could get the good outcomes without going through the tough stuff. And people came up with stories, and you know, they could talk about the time they thought that they could do just fine in a piano recital, and they skipped the practice. Telling the stories of what it felt like to be halfway through the piece, and all of a sudden you started doing a meltdown and falling apart right there on the stage. And one person had shared the story of how they finally had to run in humiliation to get off the platform because they had thought they could do a piano recital without the practice. Times when people decided they could ace a test without really studying. Times when they could go on a great date with somebody new and not do anything to learn anything about that person or you know, they just thought they could rely on their own natural charm. And you know, different people had different stories of how something fell apart. But we were using that to present the basic principle, there is no resurrection without the cross. You can't skip the hard stuff and expect the good outcomes. You can't expect some wonderful day of celebration of the resurrection where you have lilies and flowers and eggs and 
your finest clothes without going through the tough stuff that comes, leads up to it. I shared a story about a friend of mine a few weeks ago who had had a back injury and he was really complaining because he said, I haven't been able to get to the gym because of my injury. And he was complaining, he says, I'm getting chubby. And so he was really trying to figure out how he was going to get back in shape. And I said, hey, I've got a really great solution for you. And I sent him a picture I use in one of my classes. And it's of a young man who is taking a selfie. Selfie, the picture where you put yourself on a social media platform. But in this picture, obviously, he's done a few little adjustments because there is striped wallpaper in the background behind him. And you can see the stripes in the wallpaper go out like this around his shoulders. And around his waist, you can see the striped wallpaper come in like this. Obviously, he's done a few little Photoshopped adjustments. And I told my friend, I said, hey, just skip the gym. Don't worry about all the hard stuff. Just get a good Photoshopper. Save yourself all the tough stuff. Well, basic point here, when we look at things like the last plagues and some of the events described in Revelation, a reminder, you can't get to the glorious ending without some tough stuff on the way. And that's part of life. Part of what God is doing within us. Part of how we grow. If you try to skip that, you miss something really important. You know, I can think about some of my great adventures doing things like rock climbing. There was something about the combination of the really tough climb and the exhilaration of being on the summit. Each one added to the other. There's something about the preparation that people go through through the tough stuff that really prepares them for the glory of the coming of the Lord. So that's the first basic point I want to make. When we talk about, we look at some of the grim parts of Revelation. We look at everything from trumpets to seals to finally the seven last plagues, we realize these are definitely some of the darkest points in human history. But they're also a reminder that there's something about the growth process. There's something about going through those difficult things that you need. If you skip it, you miss something. Earlier this week, I was reading a story about how we have tried to fool our immune system by keeping ourselves from all germs. And the article was saying there's a lot of research that shows you actually do better with some germs. And one of the reasons there's so many you know, food allergies, all kinds of food sensitivities, sensitivities to things in the environment, is that people have tried too hard to protect themselves from all germs. And even years ago when the polio epidemic was at its peak, they discovered that the rich kids were getting a lot more polio than the poor kids. The reason for that was their parents were trying too hard to protect them from germs. And they're saying your immune system needs something to do. It's there to help fight the germs, but if you keep yourself from being exposed to the germs, you actually make yourself more vulnerable. I'll tell that to my mom, who I said, you know, she was uh, the only person I know that could hear germs breaking and entering at night. So anyway, we, we learned, I remember I, I kind of was raised on the germ theory and the starving children in um, wherever, you'd pick the country of your choice. But, you know, I know I learned that germs are something terrible. Keep them away. But we actually know that there's, even with germs, there's something valuable about them. So that's the first basic point. But I, but I also want to pick up the flip side. There are also people who take last day events and it turned it into some kind of modern equivalent of the horror story. They so much get into all the gruesomeness and the horror of it. And it's kind of like when we were kids, we were all used to love to tell ghost stories. And then we discovered that ghost stories and last day event stories are kind of similar. You, know, you can tell last day event stories and all the gruesome things that will happen. And you sit there and you shiver and you shake and you, know, you think, oh, this is really scary stuff. The weird thing about it, though, is that 
the Bible presents more positive signs of the end than negative signs. Yes, there are some negative things that happened before the second coming of Jesus, but the Bible also talks about the really wonderful things. Signs of the end. Things like the gospel going to all the world. Things like the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Things like the Elijah message. Broken relationships are, are healed and mended. People come together. There are so many positive promises associated with the end of time. And the tragedy is some of us have turned it into some giant horror movie where we get a big adrenaline rush out of all the horror things of the last day events. And we miss the real point. So two things to be careful about. One is that we can skip all the hard stuff, we can get right to the resurrection without the cross, or we can get right to the second coming without the trouble or the difficulty or the challenges along the way. But the other flip side is when we turn this into some story where we dwell so much on the positive things, I mean on the negative things, that we miss the really good things about the second coming. Well, let me share with you some of the basic themes that I think that our, our lesson is really packed. If you notice, the lesson this time is it's, it's dense with material in a really good way because I think one thing it does is it really lays out what I believe is a real positive contribution of some of the best Seventh-day Adventist scholars to the understanding of eschatology. It's an antidote to a long-standing tendency to tie eschatology or last day events too much to the latest headlines in the newspaper. To try to locate everything in terms of literal battles in the Middle East, and one time it's gonna be Russia, and it's been Turkey, and it's been China, and it's been, you know how all these scenarios unfold. People look for the latest and greatest headline that sounds the most contemporary, and they somehow develop all these scenarios with Armageddon and the kings of the east and the drying up of the Euphrates and you know, plagues, everything, and they tie it to the latest headlines. And the headlines change, the stories change. There's kind of a whole industry of last day events out there if you look at popular Christian bookstores. Stories about, you know, even now perhaps some young person growing up in the Middle East, maybe the next Antichrist. Stories talking about, you know, the literal areas around Megiddo and talking about the, the battles that will be happening there. Well, I think our lesson does a really good job of just showing the actual principles of Bible prophecy. How Bible prophecy is not really about giving us some kind of insider knowledge into the upcoming events in the Middle East, the political powers that will be fighting the exact nature of modern warfare and how that will be a fulfillment of ancient prophecy. But it's about the way in which themes that are introduced in the very book of Genesis unfold throughout the Bible. And then they find their fulfillment, their final fulfillment, in the book of Revelation. From Genesis to Revelation, there are some common themes. So one of the things we discover is that there are, the, the very, in, back in the Garden of Eden itself, we find Adam and the beast, the animals. He names the animals. They come before him. Then we discover all the different themes that are introduced there, the positive themes of what God is doing, what God will do with salvation. And then we discover the, uh, the way this unfolds in some ways of the flood story is the undoing of creation. It takes all the same themes, everything from animals to the son of man to the waters, and it kind of undoes them and it, it turns them in the reverse. And then we discover a whole series of events to follow. You remember the building of the Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel, the idea that we can somehow save ourselves, the tower that reaches to the sky, the original Tower of Babylon. 
And ultimately the Tower of Babylon is knocked down. It falls apart. It does not end up being the great solution to the human problems. But this same theme is introduced, these same themes are introduced in the book of Daniel. And Daniel tells, builds on several of these things. The waters, the beasts, the tower. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar builds this giant figure. Once again, the same theme. Worship that which is human, that which is created, and that will be your great salvation. Anyway, even the 666 is found there in the book of Daniel. Now, we miss it because most of our modern translations don't preserve the original figures of cubits. But the tower, the tower of Babylon, the image of the beast was 666. Six cubits by six cubits by 60 cubits. And so ultimately, the term 666 would evoke for the readers of Revelation, it would evoke memories and hark back to the Babylonian image presented on the plain of Dura. We also noticed there was at that time a death penalty. If you do not bow, your, bow to the image of the Babylonian beast, you will lose your life. Various ways in which these themes develop. Um, you know, even the mark. There's a mark on the forehead or in the hand. But there's positive and negative marks presented throughout the Bible. The negative marks on the, you know, the, the mark of Cain. But in Deuteronomy chapter six, it also talks about the mark of the Ten Commandments on the forehead and on the hands of, the, of those who follow God. So anyway, I just want to point out that we can't go through all the different aspects of this, but I think our lesson, man, it, it's a lot of material in a short amount of space. But I think it really unfolds some of the things, some of the best Seventh-day Adventist scholars are doing with apocalyptic interpretation. This is not primarily something that gives us exact predictions into human political events somewhere in the Middle East. This is an unfolding of the great salvation story and what is at the heart and core of beastliness. What are the great principles that divide those who follow God from those who don't? Well, anyway, I want to get into you know, the, a key theme that the lesson talks about, which is the drying up of the water's and what that means in terms of the Babylonians. You know, it talks about Megiddo, Armageddon, those kind of things, and it's interesting. The Megiddo itself is not a mountain, the mountain of Megiddo, Armageddon. Armageddon. But Megiddo is on a plain, and behind it is a mountain. Do you know what the mountain is? Mount Carmel. And you remember what happened on Mount Carmel. That was where fire fell down from heaven. That was also where a great cosmic conflict was enacted between the prophets of Baal and the true prophet Elijah, the prophet of the living God. So in so many ways, the very story of Megiddo is the story, a retelling of the story of Elijah and the ultimate fulfillment of that before the Lord comes. There will indeed be a great struggle over worship. The worship of the true God versus the worship of the, of the more contemporary equivalent of Baal. But it's also interesting, it, talks, the, 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 it, ev it evokes the story of, from the book of Daniel, Belshazzar's feast. Now, the historian Herodotus talks about the background, the backdrop to the, the, the events of Belshazzar's feast. And of course, you remember the story. Daniel is called, Daniel, an old man at the time. Daniel is called to interpret the handwriting on the wall. And he has to tell the news that the days of the kingdom are numbered. And Herodotus tells the story about how King Cyrus was able to divert the waters of the great river Euphrates and was able to march into the seemingly impenetrable city of Babylon on the dry riverbed because he diverted the waters of the great river Euphrates. 
Now our lesson, I won't get into all the details, but I think it does a really great job of explaining the contemporary meaning of that. And it points out that before Christ comes, the support systems for the powers of Babylon will be dried up. And the support systems are the people and the nations and the multitudes that are all supporting last day Babylon. And it parallels something in the book Great Controversy where those who have been supportive of the powers of Babylon ultimately turn on the very powers that, have, that they have once supported. Got some mic problems. But I wanted to develop that theme and to exp ex expand on it in some depth. The fact that ultimately the people who support Babylon turn against it. And I want to de develop this theme in a little bit more depth when we talk about you know, the symbolic drying up of the river Euphrates and look at some lessons from history. Lessons in which people have been caught up by tyrants, by people who, for at least a brief and shining moment, managed to capture their attention and offer a great solution to all of the human problems. The history of revolutions, the history of totalitarian movements, the history of how people get all, get, get all caught up in the idea that some earthly power, some human being has the great resources, the ability to solve all human problems. You know, you see it even in terms of the negative power of the, the multitudes that gathered at the time of the crucifixion of Jesus. They thought that if they could just get rid of Jesus, their problems would be solved. I think of a, of a story of um, a man named Arthur Kessler, an author who wrote about his own experiences when he got caught up in Marxism, world communism. And he thought that this would indeed be a solution to the great problems of inequality, how this would, would solve some of the great economic problems. And he, the book he wrote was entitled The God That Failed. And he talks about his disillusionment. And I think that's an, an interesting example of something what we call the waters drying up principle. And I want to share that because it's easy for us to look at something that we think will be the great answer to our inner longings and it ends up in some way drying up. One of the interesting things reading some of the story, yeah, you know, this week has been a kind of an interesting one in terms of stories. You remember one of the, the big hot stories was the college admission scandals. A lot of people in serious trouble over things they did to try to get their kids in college, in prestigious colleges, and read some of the stories, you know, talk about shortcuts. They actually had their faces of their kids photoshopped onto the body of an athlete. To try to present the picture, because you know, that's apparently one of the big criteria for getting into some of the, 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 the universities, is if you could be on an athletic team, a coach could say, yeah, I want that person for my team. There might have been bribery behind the scenes. But some of the things people did to get there, photoshopping faces onto the bodies of athletes. But one of the other things I was reading about is even talking about some of the people who'd gotten into the colleges. It was talking about the, the phenomena of influencers. Have you heard of influencers? Social media phenomena where they discover that you know, the, the, you know, the, the companies try to find people who are active on places like um, YouTube or Facebook or Instagram or something like that, and they actually pay people money to try to advertise their products on their social media sites. And there's a whole phenomenon of influencers. And one of the tragic things for some people in the whole college admission scandal is that young people who had been 
influencers suddenly had their powers withdrawn because now they were tainted with scandal. There's a major cosmetic product line that had, you, had worked with one of the young people and suddenly they're saying, you know, we're not going to support you anymore. But I use this to talk about the fact that sometimes when you build too much in terms of your hopes and dreams on the wrong premise, sooner or later, the waters dry up. And that's actually the whole phenomena behind what we call idolatry. Do you know the actual meaning of the term, you know, the, an idol? An idol is a nothing. That's the actual meaning of, the, of an idol in, in the Bible. In the very end of time, the ultimate nothing will attract the worship of the world. People will get caught up in the excitement of the moment, the dreams, the hopes, and the false promises. And one of the things the book of Revelation is saying, ultimately all idols come to nothing. They promise you something that you can't, they can't deliver. And people ultimately turn on their idols. The waters dry up. They turn on Babylon. I want to give you just a few images to think of. Have you ever gone through your old high school yearbook and found a picture of your ex? Somebody at one point in your life you had just thought would have been the most wonderful person in the world. And maybe it wasn't even your ex. It was somebody you longed and hoped might fall in love with you, and they didn't. And you look back at them and you say, oh, what did I ever see in them? Old Garth Brooks song, thank God for unanswered prayers. But remember some of the products. Remember some of the clothes. Remember some of the, oh, hairdos that you wore back then. And certainly those are fads and so forth. You know, I've told my story of when I bought the Nehru jacket that was supposed to transform me into the ultimate cool person. The last time I was home, my youngest brother had discovered it tucked away in a closet somewhere and presented it to me as a gift. That was the item of clothing that was going to turn me cool. This geeky kid who had grown from the shortest kid in the eighth grade class to the tallest kid in the, in the 12th grade class, I mean the tallest boy, uh, shortest boy, the tallest boy, the Nehru jacket was going to make me cool. It didn't. But I want to also another image I've thought of. Have you ever you looked online and seen these pictures of deserted shopping malls? Ones that had once been thriving, teeming centers of life and vitality and energy and hope and shopping and people coming out with great bags full of stuff. People gathered in the food courts and the different places between the shops and socializing. Some of the most haunting, spooky store, uh, pictures you can find, shopping malls that are now deserted. I want you to use those as images that remind you, don't put too much faith in things that ultimately don't satisfy. Be aware of your own vulnerabilities because ultimately before the second coming of Jesus, people will get caught up in false promises. People will get deceived by illusions and delusions. And it can happen so fast. Look at human history, how often people have been caught up in movements that ultimately turned to dust. And you read the stories of people in the aftermath of dictators 
and leaders, charismatic leaders who caught them up in this great magic moment of euphoria and ultimately the waters of Babylon dry up. But there is a source of water that is not the river Euphrates that dries up, that cuts off the support for Babylon. There is the living water of Jesus Christ. There is also the way that that is symbolized in Revelation in the sea of glass. The saints who gather around the sea of glass and are singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. My challenge to you is to learn to discern. Know your vulnerabilities. Know when you're prone to getting caught up in something that ultimately doesn't satisfy, that doesn't live up to its promises, something that will dry up and let you down. Contrast that with the streams of living water. Jesus Christ. And the invitation you have to be part of that great throng that gathers singing the song of Moses and the Lamb by the sea of glass. Let us pray. Father, just give us a moment to think about those images of desolation and realize that's what all that is not you will ultimately become. May we also think about the multitudes that gather singing the song of Moses and the Lamb, the living waters, the source of the fountains that never run dry. May those be the waters that circulate through our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.